Good morning. Welcome to day two of Chardon's fifth annual Genetic Medicines Manufacturing Summit. My name is Kane Akai. I'm a senior healthcare analyst at Chardon. It's my pleasure to introduce our first guest this morning, Oxford Biomedica. Representing them is Chief Executive Officer John Dawson and Chief Scientific Officer Dr. Kiri Michifano. The format for the session is a roughly 40 minute fireside chat. If any of our audience, audience attendees have questions during the session, feel free to type them into the question box under the video player, and we will try to ask them on your behalf. So let's get started. John, Curie, welcome. Thank you. Hi, good to see you. So John, to start, could you provide a couple minutes of introductory comments about Oxford Biomedica for audience attendees new to the company? Of course, um, I'll probably use the slides here as well. Go to the next slide, please. So, yeah. so, Oxford Biomedica has been in existence since 1996 as a cell and gene therapy company and um, we are part of the fast growing cell and gene therapy world and we are the world leaders now in lentiviral uh, technologies. We had the first FDA approved lentiviral vector delivery system with uh, Novartis and Kim Raya. and now we have multiple partnerships working with some very good companies uh, to name but a few, Novartis, Bristol Myers, Sio, AstraZeneca, and Boeing Ingelheim. We work on a model of a hybrid company. So um, our CDMO revenues now provide a solid growing financial foundation for our business, but also we have additional potential upside with our proprietary pipeline. Over the last couple of years, we've moved into FTSE 250 in the UK in the main list. Um, and, and now we have 18 partner programs with leading companies, um, six proprietary programs and over 670 staff in our base in Oxford. All of these uh, five sites in Oxford now, all of them total about 200,000 square feet and uh, we plan to expand further as necessary. Next slide, please. A bit of background on our strategy. The backbone of our company is our lentiviral vector delivery platform. And that has four main pillars the IP, patents and know-how, and these allow us to have patents during, uh, sorry, royalty income, I should say, during the patent life and beyond with know-how. So we have some very good income of that as well. Facilities I've spoken about already. Expertise, um, we've grown from 60 people back in 2014 to 320 or so at the end of 17 to 670 at the end of 2020. So growing very quickly. And um, some of that is explained by what we're doing with the, uh, the vaccine as well. One of our unique selling propositions to our partners is our set of quality systems. And they're so important to us to sell what we do. And having FDA approval for commercial supply of Kimbaya is really important as well. And working with some of the bigger companies, they want to see these great quality systems in place. Then coming down and thinking about uh, what we actually do day to day, on the left hand side, we have the CDMO partner programs, and we have 18 of those. They can bring us various types of revenues and process development fees and incentives by processing revenues and royalties. And I've named a few of our, our partners there before, but there's um, others as well, AZ, Beam and Sire, to name but a couple have come in the last, uh, last period or so. To the right hand side, we have our gene therapeutics or proprietary pipeline, and we have six drugs there. And we out licensed um, our drug Parkinson's drug back in 18 to Sire, and that gives us development funding, upfront some milestones and royalties. Plus of course, they become a manufacturing customer to us. And we can also choose to internally develop some of these drugs, which we are now striving to do. We are going to take some of these drugs we have in our proprietary portfolio towards phase one, two trials and move forward with those as time goes on. Next slide, please. And just a few high level things about 20. Um, we saw our revenues grow by 45% to 87 million in 2020, operating a bit positive there above guided range, which was great at 7.3 million. We signed new lentivector deals with um, Juno BMS and Beam Therapeutics, but also now we're working on the Oxford, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine with them. We're producing at um, thousand litre scale for that, and we're producing uh, millions of doses as, as we speak almost. So effectively playing a huge part in fighting the pandemic um, in the UK and uh, elsewhere as well. Our new facility, Oxbox, came live in early 20. Working with that, it was approved by the MHR and RA for all four suites we have open at the moment um, during 2020. The last two were expedited and approval to work on the vaccine. Last year, we successfully raised um, back in June 40 million pounds with new and existing investors, and we moved into the FTSE 250. That's probably a good a summary of the company there. So um, back to you, Kate.
Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, so <clears throat> I think our audience members are well aware of the exponential growth we're seeing in cell and gene therapy as more early stage identif companies identify novel CGT targets, the demand for CGT development and manufacturing capacity has grown to the point where demand is currently creating a backlog as it exceeds uh, supply. So from your perspective as a leading CDMO, what is the state of CGT industry in terms of capacity? As far as we see it in the moment, the sector's reached about a thousand companies. So it's growing very quickly, as you just said. What we see is um, suppliers increasing as well, but we think that um, demand will continue to exceed supply. Back in um, you know, 2018, I think it was, we projected the market forward purely in lentivile vectors and we expected a billion dollar market for that manufacturing. That's manufacturing only without the royalties by 2026. We think this is conservative and therefore that's why we built our new plant, 84,000 square feet, which we are half populated already going forward. So thinking about where this is going, we see a lot of companies decide to either go to commercial houses like ourselves or do it in-house, but what we have seen so far in, um, in the evolution of cell and gene therapy is that manufacturing has been difficult for many companies to do themselves, even with some CDMOs. And we've seen many manufacturing issues delay launch of drugs, hurt companies badly um, as they go forward. And again, this is something working with us we believe you can avoid. So compounding the capacity constraints, manufacturing of CGT products is complex. Many have stated that the current need for manufacturing innovation is similar to the evolution that occurred with the introduction of monoclonal antibodies, which themselves were much more complex than small molecules. Fundamental principles that underpin the success of monoclonal <clears throat> antibody manufacturing innovation was a solid understanding of the product biology and its critical um, quality attributes, then designing processes to control for these and then planning for analytical studies, tech transfers required to advance these to next generation processes into the clinic. So in your view, where's the industry and its understanding of the biology of gene therapies and the delivery vectors, whether they be AAV, Lenti or uh, ADNO? Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, so as an industry, we have made huge strides in the manufacture of lentiviral I don't know, an AAV vectors, but there is a long way to go before their manufacture isn't gating therapeutic applications, either due to the amount, you know, the dose or, or the quality of the vector we, we can produce. Innovation and the development of lentiviral vector platform are core to OXP's goal of industrializing lentiviral vectors. We continue to invest in the lentiviral vector platform in order to maintain our lead in this area and to further industrialize the manufacturing process. A big part of this relies on analytics, which allows us to understand what is taking place during manufacture. At OXP, we have invested heavily in mass spec capability that tells us about the protein composition of the vector in the cells uh, and bioinformatics and automation. Our aim is to be able to gain a, a deeper understanding of the biology of vector production. We are doing this by carrying out more detailed experiments using automated systems to set up those experiments and then process the samples generated for automated analysis. Data from these studies can then be analyzed to gain a deeper understanding of the biology of vector production. We are also analyzing production cells and vectors for their RNA com content, uh, as well as the protein, and also analyzing batches of vector during production. These types of analyses generate huge data sets that are best processed and understood by uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, which has led us to our collaboration uh, with Microsoft. The aim is to understand vector production better, and from this, how to increase those components that improve yield and quality and remove those that don't or are not needed. In addition, understanding how vectors behave in the target cells is also critical. When, when we're carrying out ex vivo gene therapy, for example, what are the best culturing conditions to maintain the phenotype that is most likely to achieve efficacy? And can the cells be engineered to not only express the genes of interest, but also guide cell fate for a superior therapeutic uh, outcome? So with all this complexity, you know, clearly the, the CDMO model is very much at the heart 
of CGT manufacturing compared to traditional biologics, you know, beyond your um, investment and the knowledge you've gained in these specific aspects, how else has Oxford shifted its business model to support the needs of small biotechs developing lentivirus, lentiviral based gene therapies? You've, you've experienced tremendous growth, growth as you outlined, but what else have, are you doing to support um, the small companies? It's a really good question. And we have a very flexible model in our approach of how we do things to make sure we can cater for the smaller companies as well. What's important to us here is good science and likelihood of the program progressing. What we want to do is have a partner we can work with to take to market in the future. Um, if we get something that breaks down quickly in um, early stages, then it's not good for them or good for us. So we're very careful what we work with. That said, um, if we have a really exciting company to work with, we can look at all types of models here. Um, they can't afford sometimes to pay us up front or whatever. So we don't actually insist on that, but we can do, for example, at Orchard Therapeutics many years ago when they were first formed, we worked with them in manufacturing and did a lot of work for them in analytics and all manner of things as well. And in doing that, we took the upfront and the milestones along the way in shares. And of course, when they IPO'd, the share price went up and we did quite nicely from that. So it was good for both parties and didn't actually um, cost them all their cash at the time. But we are now much more financially strong than we used to be. Uh, we don't need now the upfronts we used to sort of uh, think about getting in the past. And we can structure a deal to have more risk and more back end in it as well. So that's great. The financial strength gives you opportunities and we can now choose how we work with the right companies. Great. And, you know, in terms of your own expansion, you know, you, you touched on your new manufacturing facility, Oxbox. It opened in 2020. It received the um, MHRA approval you talked about for the four GMP suites. So give us more detail about uh, Oxbox, um, you know, where it is in terms of uh, operating at full capacity and, and what are your other plans for future investments? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, thinking about um, Oxbox, we built that, um, it's 84,000 square feet. We populated only half to start with. So we have four GMP suites there. Plus we have fin and finish, which is really important. Not an expensive part of the process, but we decided it's best to have control of that because it had caused a few problems over time. So that's a great thing to have. Now, we, what we did with Oxbox, we guaranteed future capacity when the right time came. We built out the other half and um, we did a lot of the spade work ready so we can pop in there other GMP suites we need to and depending what size we actually put in the bioreactors we could choose to have uh, maybe four to six GMP suites or as little as three to four if you go for much bigger bioreactors so we're deciding that where we get to at the right point in time now that allows us to have massive capacity now and going forward we've got running four GMP suites at the moment three of those are making in a thousand liter bioreactors the vaccine for AZ the other one is working on our um Lentivec to work as well with some of the other suites we had previously. So that's all going very nicely. And we have quite a few scenarios uh, worked up to decide when and how to build out the other half of Oxbox to give us more capacity again. Of course, that fixed one part of the log jam we had. We had to make sure the um, other part was fixed as well. First part, GMP suites is now solved. Now we're working on uh, what we call Windrush Innovation Center and our, uh, our old head office building, Windrush Court, put in more laboratories, state-of-the-art laboratories to allow us to have the space for the analytics and development that we need as well. So that's the final part of the um, declogging process to make sure we can do what we need to do. After that, um, if we filled up Oxbox, a great problem to have, be worrying about building another building after that. And if we have that problem, which I expect us to, it's just a question of time till, till we do. It'd be a great problem to have to think about what we do with that and where we put it. Okay, well, let's drill down to, into some more uh, specifics. Um, you're advancing using cell factories for cell culture to, and using bioreactors at, at Oxbox. What's next in your strategy here and what work are you doing to innovate your production processes? Um, Sophia, will you put up the innovation wheel, please? Yeah, thank you. So our, our aim at Oxford Biomedica is to industrialize a lentiviral vector production and reduce the cost through innovation. Uh, the, the aim is for OXB to open up the therapeutic indications that would not be uh, treatable, uh, addressable in, with the current uh, manufacturing processes. Can we make 
a more vector to a higher quality that allows us therefore to, to treat more diseases. Uh, the platform development activities have three aspects. So we are looking to increase the capability of the vectors, to improve the yield, meaning the amount of vector that we generate, and also improve the quality of the vector, in, in other words, removing impurities. In, in terms of capability, we are seeking to develop vectors that allow regulation of the gene of interest to fine tune the therapeutic effect. We're looking to develop tissue specific expression and also developing targeted vectors to be able to genetically modify specific cell types. To produce more vector, we are further optimizing our bioreactor processes and incorporating technologies we have developed that improve the yield and quality, such as uh, improvements to the bioreactor process, incorporating two technologies called U1 and U2. These are undisclosed technologies that increase the particle to infectivity ratio and the amount of vector generated and other systems such as the TRIP and, and SecNuke. Uh, these uh, lead to an increase in the quality of the, of the vector system. In the future, uh, we are looking to move most products to be manufactured using packaging and producer cell lines, as these have better scalability and productivity. One of the challenges in gene therapy manufacturing is the time to product release. We're investing in technologies such as automation and developing assays that will speed this up. So, so Kiri, you know, um, clearly you have a, a great vision for where you're going here. In terms of some of these specific um, <clears throat> steps, which ones do you feel you've made the most progress on to date? Uh, and which other ones maybe are relying on uh, new technology innovations to take them to the next step? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So we, we are, learning from, uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, the monoclonal antibody world, applying some of the knowledge there, but also through our understanding of the biology of lentiviral vectors, the cells during manufacture, uh, tweaking the promoters, the components uh, to achieve a, a, a better production uh, activity uh, during production. The, the, the challenges, I think, with uh, lentiviral vectors um, are, uh, in terms of downstream downstream processing, they're more fragile than ad AAV vectors or adeno. Um, so over the last 20 years, we've been developing processes that allow us to take that into account. Um, the particle to infectivity ratio, we have, we have uh, assays that allow us to monitor this and understand what is happening to our particles from the uh, from the as soon as they are made to uh, what how they are in the, in the, in the in the final file, um, the industry uh, I think is is looking to, in terms of lenti, is to improve the absolute amount of lenti's lentiviral vector particles made, and to remove the impurities that go along with any cellular production. So the DNA impurities, host cell proteins, and and others. And we've made great strides in in this area. Um, we are looking to bring all this together to a new process called process C. So our process A was an adherent serum based process. Process B was a 200 liter serum free suspension process. We're now moving to process C, which will be a, a incorporate some of the technologies uh, shown on this, uh, on this uh, slide that again, should be a step up in product productivity from process A to process B. We saw around a tenfold improvement in productivity, and we are challenging ourselves to achieve the same with process C. In the future, there will be a process D that is focused on uh, uh, packaging and producer cell lines, which uh, have inherent advantages uh, over transient transfection. Okay, great. Um, so <clears throat> I think that one of the other things you mentioned is, is your QC uh, trying to um, reduce the time to get qualified product released. Um, this is another um, issue that many of our companies talked about yesterday as well. Um, their, their want to be able to, to control this variable. Um, so as the CDMO, you know, what, what can you do? What are you trying to do to improve this specific step? Yeah, so, so that, yeah, that, that, that's a, a, a good question. There are a number of answers. Um, so 
the challenges we have with manufacturing lentiviral vectors and then releasing them um, is some of the assays take a long time. So for example, the replication competent lentivirus assay. So this is an assay that looks to uh, looks for the presence of uh, uh, vector particles that can replicate in essence. And this can, uh, the theory is that this could arise from non-homologous recombination. No, no one's ever found these things, but it is, uh, you have to have an assay to, to look for those and it's one of the longest assays. Um, because it is uh, using a, a HIV attenuated virus as a positive control, you have to do the assay in category level three. Uh, we have four of these at Oxford Biomedica, and um, we are we we basically the more batches we make, the more full these these uh, facilities are in terms of testing. One of the things we've done is over the last two years we have spent a lot of effort in automating these RCL assays. So instead of having very highly trained staff um, around the clock doing these assays, we've automated the process. This can release our staff to to other things, uh, uh, given the, the difficulty of recruiting and retaining uh, good quality staff. We want them to do the best work and, and that, that they can and, and the most useful. Um, so things that we can automate, we want to automate. So an example is, uh, to answer your question is we automating key assays uh, initially in research, then moving that work into GMP. The idea is that the GMP, um, we've, we've developed the assays, the, the automated assays, show that they work, understand their, their accuracy, precision, and, and so on, and then uh, move them into GMP. Uh, other things we're doing is that we're bringing in uh, laboratory management uh, uh, systems, so the LIM systems. This allows us uh, to uh, minimize the paperwork automate the paperwork, which again leads to a faster uh, release of the of the results. Okay, so, you know, all, all companies um, face make or buy decisions at some point, and some are choosing a hybrid strategy. So from your perspective as a CDMO, in terms of risk benefit, which tasks can the emerging biotech company take on and which are better left for the CDMO to perform under a hybrid strategy? I think, I mean, again, we've, um, under the hybrid strategy, we operate as that ourselves. So we have the uh, products alongside the, um, the manufacturing. What depends upon what assets you're looking at, but certainly um, when we've looked at this very carefully, we have the manufacturing area under control. So we're very confident we can take our own drugs forward. And we've seen many other people fail on that basis. So I think really, if you're going to decide whether to actually take your drugs forward with your CDMO, actually it's deciding who can be successful for you and which parts they do for you. I mean, we, we would normally do the uh, manufacturing, the fill and finish and analytical testing for anybody we work for. And that's what I would be looking for in many, many cases. Uh, what we don't do, I mean, what we won't be doing ourselves either when we have our own drugs taken forward, is self-processing. We believe that's uh, something we um, we outsource, even though it's outsource that ourselves. So I'd be very, I would be very thoughtful about uh, doing which parts you do and who you use for them in that process. Okay. Well, <clears throat> when considering your proprietary product pipeline, what advantages, you know, beyond capacity? Um, do lenti lentiviral vectors have uh, over other viral vectors? So the, the main lentiviral vector advantages for cell and gene therapy are that, that the large therapeutic payload up to 10 kb, 12 kb, uh, they lead to a permanent modification of cells, dividing or non-dividing. So lentiviral vectors insert the genetic information into the uh, host cell, the target cell uh, uh, chromosomes. So if those cells divide, that modification is maintained. Uh, also, lentiviral vectors have no uh, pre-existing in immunity. Uh, th these advantages mean that lentiviral vectors may be the only currently available technology that is suited to a particular treatment. For example, delivery of a large therapeutic gene or multiple genes into tissues such as the eye or the brain or stem cells or T cells uh, for T cell CAR T therapy, for example. Uh, for 
for, for OXB, the our product priority is to um, further build our pipeline. Our focus is on products that have a high unmet need, high disease severity, and appropriate risk benefit. Um, we licensed our Parkinson's therapy to Cyogene Sci Therapies in 2018. Um, uh, this is a product called Axel NTPD and is designed to supply dopamine to the areas of the brain that lack this neurotransmitter critical for movement. Last year, SIO released some very encouraging data from the ongoing clinical trial uh, showing that uh, the six months data in the second cohort, there was a 40% improvement in UT UPDRS part three off score. This is a measure of how well the patients move uh, over baseline and also a favorable safety and, uh, and tolerability profile. The overall improvement in the patients is greater than that seen with our ProSavin uh, first generation vector that OXB developed uh, in the past. OXB LENTPD is now moving to the next dose group and, and we, we wait to see those, the results from that trial. In terms of our current pipeline, our lead product is OXB302 to treat hemat hematological tumors with a CAR T therapy targeting a protein found on cancer and cancer stem cells called 5T4. Preclinical work is continuing as we prepare 302 towards entry into the clinic. Um, we have a number of other products in preclinical development and a lot of work is going on to those. I would like to highlight our work in the liver. The liver is a very attractive target for lentibiol gene therapy. The liver has a high cell turnover and so ideally by using an integrating vector such as Lenti, a one-off treatment at any age becomes possible. However, these internal activities will take time. So we are also looking at the potential to in-license opportunities that are further along uh, their development path. Great. So, you know, again, you're in a unique position with both um, <clears throat> your proprietary products and your performance as a CDMO. In your opinion, how up to speed are regulatory agencies like the FDA, EMA, or others with your manufacturing approaches? So uh, I think the regulatory agencies have been very supportive, and I think they want to see cell and gene therapy succeed because of its great promise to transform patients' lives. Um, our lentiviral vectors through our own clinical trials and those of our partners have been in front of many regulatory agencies in Europe, um, in, in the US, uh, Asia, this, and this has been very useful for us to understand what regulators are after and where they see regulatory challenges in the future and how we can uh, best address them in more detailed analysis, uh, analytics, um, further characterization of products uh, and, and, and so on. As the agents get more familiar with the manufacturing processes and as more products are successful, and more patients are treated, then the safety profile of the vectors is becoming clearer. So I think by, by that means they be, they're becoming more aware and, and um, uh, address, uh, uh, adjusting the, the regulatory guidelines, hopefully to take this into account. Cell and gene therapy is a broad area that includes ex vivo and in vivo, lenti, AAV, adeno, um, et cetera. So some batches of, vec of product are sufficient to treat uh, thousands of patients for a particular indication. Others can only treat 10. Therefore, we, we, we are thankful that the regulators take this into account when we are talking to them about the, uh, how many uh, doses or how much vector to test for various assays. It, it, is, it is critical that uh, this aspect is, is taken into account and, and it, it, there is not just one cell or gene therapy product. The, there is a lots of different vectors and lots of different products and um, the regulations need to reflect this variability. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's shift to another topic, which is um, other, others have cited the lack of qualified workforce talent as a current capacity constraint. You know, you've, you've expanded rapidly you know, what is your strategy for attracting, developing, and maybe more importantly, retaining qualified people? 
fundamental to getting the job right, I think, is actually retaining people. It's, we put a lot of work into this, but finding the right people as well. So the pace of growth has been important. We have active employee engagement programs, we have proactive measuring of employee engagements, um, opportunities for de development programs and progression, really important development programs for all staff. And we have a workforce engagement panel as well, and a board representation on that to make sure things go well. Uh, the right rewards is really important to us. And um, the number we got last year of new recruits was about 120. And I think the culture of how you do things and how you include people is really important too. And the success of the company, not so much in financial terms, but more in the way we've managed to change patients' lives has been really important. First of all, working with Kim Raya, seeing um, children being saved from paediatric leukemia, and more engagement recently on the pandemic, um, obviously working on the vaccine. We know that what we've done has saved tens of thousands of lives at this point in time. So I think that's a great way to motivate the company. Everyone's really behind that to a particular role. So I think it's actually something we've, that's actually been worked very hard at as a, on a professional basis, but the way you work with people and the way you can apply what you do as a business to help all people is very important as well. Great. You know, part of your, your uh, specific growth um, has been associated with the development of the COVID-19 vaccines. This has been accomplished at unprecedented speed. Um, <clears throat> you, you obviously been involved with uh, AstraZeneca's manufacturing. And given that um, AZ's vaccine is adenovirus based and you know, your, your expertise has been with lentiviral vectors, um, <clears throat> help us understand um, more about your experience here and you know, having um, gone through this experience, you know, what does this mean for Oxford in the future? Well, strangely, um, it's something we did so quickly because effectively, we worked on getting the vaccine up and running in the thousand anti reactors. What would normally take 10 months took us five because the people were so devoted. So the staff were fantastic, but the expertise was amazing as well. So we took what we knew and making lentivar vectors. It's commonly known that um, lentivar vectors are harder to make than adenos or AAVs. Um, those other secondaries are quite a bit more robust, shall we say, in the manufacturing process. We scaled up for the first time doing this from the 200 litre bioreactor to the thousand litre. Uh, and demonstrates our expertise way beyond Lenti at that point in time as well. The learnings we've had from this have been very useful to us to apply to our, our Lenti platform as well. And I think it's actually one of those things we were on. Um, the way it's worked out is we did something very publicly because we had to move quickly, we had to do this. Um, and we had a lot of accolades for doing it, certainly within the UK and other places as well. But it's actually managed to actually make us um, clearly and a vector agnostic company and how we approach things for the future so we can do other vectors too. And it's quite interesting in having done that and having had this success in the other companies, both current and new potential customers have come to us about vectors other than just the lent vectors. Okay, uh, let me ask you a couple of um, questions we've gotten from the audience. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, your internal programs that you showed on an earlier slide slide. Um, what is your strategy to continue to um, develop your own internal programs as opposed to, to being uh, a CDMO or possibly, as you mentioned, uh, out license uh, other programs? I think there's a massive, massive rationale for us going forward in our hybrid strategy to bring our own drugs forward to phase one, two and beyond. What we're working at actively now is to get our proprietary portfolio up towards that. We're, we're probably 18 to 24 months away from having something in the clinic at this point in time. But I think this is something we really are excited about doing. And if you talk about um, the cell gene therapy market, the integrated companies, what we have done with our work so far is, able, is perfect the art of lentivector viral vector manufacturing. A lot of companies have fallen foul of that because it is very hard to do. The barriers to entry are very high. And we believe we've got a very big part of the equation to make a drug successful in what we can do with it to make it. So that's important to us. We have um, been a, a product development company in the past, in our early years before we moved across to being the CDMO type approach alongside it. We were making it doing our own drugs then. So we're going back to what we know. Uh, but alongside what we now know very well as well. And we actually brought our first um, GMP suite into the business when we did that. The idea was, the intention was only to make our own products there. And of course, we got approached by the people and uh, the rest is almost history. 
Great. Another question from the audience. Um, in terms of your internal programs, are the, do these tend to be homegrown or, or do they come from university programs that, that come to you or you're, you're engaged with early on and then you take forward? I think um, historically there tend to have been some homegrown and some university. Uh, now we are certainly bringing forward our organic programs without question, but we are going to be looking a lot more at universities and thinking about out sorry, in licensing, I should say, drugs into the business as well. Uh, we think it's a very good thing to do because we actually have a, a very good way to increase shareholder value by doing that. Okay. Well, let me ask you a couple of uh, forward vision looking type statements. You know, first near term, what, what does the next year hold for Oxford? Well, it's a very exciting market we live in. It's growing very, very quickly, dear, with cell and gene therapy. Um, what we always try and do is make sure we have more partners um, within our CDMO business. So what we want to do there is have uh, more partner drugs with each program, sorry, more programs with each in each partner partner um, relationship, but also new partners too. And what we tend to find is when we start working with a partner on one of their drugs, it tends to increase them all as well. So, that, so that's great. We want to move forward our proprietary pipeline, have new discoveries there, and look at potentially growing both externally and organically, really exciting to us. And I think if we do that, the business will grow very nicely. And I think one of the main things we have to do as well is make sure we are absolutely in consideration of capacity at any point in time what we've been very good at to date is anticipating the needs of capacity before it's happened built and been ready and we need to be doing that again and again and again and then looking out a little further say five years um, what do you think will be the biggest changes in the cgt manufacturing landscape five years from now I think we'll see an evolution more of the in vivo lenses alongside um, the ex vivo. As most people think about lenses for carts and other things, we've always been a pioneer of going down the in vivo route as well. There'll be a lot more of that. And there'll be more um, therapeutic areas coming in here with, for cell based and, and uh, gene based therapies as the cost of manufacturing reduces. And some of the things Kiri was talking about earlier, being able to go and look at a lung and a liver, on the very early processes, that would have been impossible. So um, all of our technologies, having these bioreactors, having TRIP, having various ways of doing things, increasing your yield. Um, the magic words we get often from people are number of doses per batch. If you can increase that tenfold with the bioreactors, potentially tenfold with another uh, piece of uh, technology such as TRIP, then you are seeing massive reductions in cost of goods you bring um, maybe the cost of goods lower and potentially make it a lot easier for payers to consider for paying for some um, areas of large uh, pop uh, populations. So John, to sum it up, how does Oxford differentiate itself as the preferred CDMO partner to work with? Well, I think what we've always done is we've made sure we optimize the, um, the target first. So if someone will give us a drug, we'll optimize it in our labs before we go near the GMP suites. We have a very good regulatory track record um, in taking these things, working with partners to market. One of our teams spoke at the ODAC meeting for Novartis is Kim Raya, which is very unusual, by the way, um, because he could put a very good case across. And we so we bring a whole range of things in our CDMO um, side of things to actually make us attractive to um, our partners. And we have confidentiality, we have uh, capacity, and we have the best analytics out there as well. So we're doing very well there. All this alongside what we do for ourselves as well with our proprietary pipeline. Okay, well, very good. Um, we've reached the end of our session here. I wanna thank John and Kiri so much for being with us today. And uh, we'll end here, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, good to talk to you.